Welcome to part two of week one of our dialogue. So yes, Mary, I, I just want, kind of wanted to share um, just something that's been going on for me um, over the past few weeks. I think we were talking a little bit earlier about, um, you know, we're, we're on lockdown. Uh, this is the fourth week now, I think, of, of lockdown. Um, and so what I've been trying to do in a kind of Gertie and heartfelt way is, is move out into nature um, and, and just be a little bit slower, really, um, because, you know, it's, it's so interesting when something like this happens, you know, so unprecedented that, um, you know, I did find myself getting a bit anxious to start off with and thinking, well, you know, what's, what's this going to mean to me? But then I sort of started to think more upstream. I started to think, well, how, what was my, what would my heart want me to do in this situation? Um, and so I decided to just sort of on my daily walk, go out and just really notice and appreciate, um, particularly at this wonderful time of year, you know, spring and the weather's been beautiful. Yeah. Um, and we're really lucky because we have a park uh, just opposite um, and just walk around the park and rather than see my daily walk as exercise, reframe that and actually see my daily walk as um, an opportunity to have a conversation with nature yeah. and to have a conversation with um, the trees and you know the flowers and, and just really notice nature coming to life yeah, and that's been a real practice for me over the past three weeks so i'm just sharing some photographs on the slide of um just how appreciative I was of, of the trees that I saw as I was walking around the park and the tulips in the flower beds um, that maybe ordinarily in my day-to-day -day life um, I might have missed or might not even have had the opportunity to even see and engage with um, because I was about to start a job um, and unfortunately I, I lost it due to the coronavirus but you know it's given me so much more when again I, I think about what it's given me so this is, you know, again, following the theme of our dialogue, which is listening and feeling and sensing and seeing. And, and it's really shown me, um, even though I try and do this practice as often as I can, and, and I'm aware of this practice, just how I can get, you know, sort of sucked back into ordinary, normal, <laughs> in inverted commas, life. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, um, I've been walking around the park and the particular trees that I've been communing with, I've been watching their... The blossom coming out and now I'm seeing that the, the blossom is is fading, blossoms dropping off the trees but these gorgeous different coloured greens are, are coming through um, and it's just like you say it's a dynamic process and I think I'm really realising um, just how I am living alongside nature and that is living and changing on, on a daily daily basis. Mm. Um, minute by minute even you know uh, I mean it's just incredible right. to really slow and slow and notice and feel like I am in a dynamic growing relationship with uh, the, the trees on my daily walk um, and it's really felt like um, a, a sort of again a, a sort of shift down to the heart and then up to to the head for me so I'm really kind of feeling and sensing this this kind of movement I don't want to call it a process because that's uh, it's not a process for me it's it's a it's a movement that mm. continually spirals and loops back around upon itself mm, mm. And, and as I'm talking in that way I just wanted to share a couple of quotes um, from uh, Romanishin um, and he says that the capacity to listen to and then I, I'm, I'm sort of adding in words here to nature in this case is is a disposition in which the words um sorry let me just uh i can't move it across um I could probably stop the share now but if i just um open that up beautiful photographs yeah thank you it's so just to say the capacity to listen is a disposition in which the words that the other speaks enter the ear and sink down to the heart before they rise to the brain and i just love that i want I just want to stay with that for a minute you know mm. that, that, that the words nature speaks they enter the ear or they enter all of our senses and again i want to add there enter all of our senses and they sink arise or sink into our heart before they rise to the brain and, and what would change if we 
certainly what changes for me when I when I take on on that particular movement is something very different to um, a, an ordinary mode of perception. Um, and then the, the second quote resonates so much with me as well, because the capacity to listen is hard work because it's hard work. Mm. And, and I was really thinking about that this morning um, that, you know, gosh, yes, it is. It's, it's hard work doing this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it's even hard kind work. Of, Yes, considering exactly. considering that way of thinking um yeah. you know it's it is hard work i'm just going to share that again so i can i can now read the bottom quote um it's very very hard work and even i have to keep reminding myself to do that um and then you know as i think about that while we might know that the heart is a biological organ no one actually experiences the heart in that fashion. So, so when I bring all of this sensory experience and I gather it up in my heart space first, no, I, okay, I experience the heart as a biological organ. Of course I do. And, and, and that's been no more clearer in my own life, having had all the, 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 the physical difficulties with my heart that I have had. But also I experience that and so much more. And we're back to this both and expansion again. Mm, absolutely. Um, so yeah. so that was really what I wanted to share in, in the sort of the theme of the theme of this week is, you know, the Gertin inquiry and, and the heart based work for me are, are so intricately linked yeah. um, that I just don't feel in, in my own world that, that I can sort of have, you know, the one with, without the other. Mm, it's be they're beautiful quotes, Louise. And I think, you know, your commentary alongside them really brings them to life as well, because we have a. An idea of the heart I suppose as as you've said you know it's either this biological organ just sort of sitting as a as the main pump in the body as Harvey um, demonstrated many years yeah. ago and um, and as you know all the sort of rise of the scientific enlightenment when they started to dissect bodies and really understand how the body worked which was a very different way to how Leonardo was carving up bodies and understanding how they worked because he was trying to understand what was behind the phenomena mm. of the body and how things work. So there was a sort of insight there. But I think we think of the heart sometimes either as that biological organ or, again, it's an either or, it becomes this mushy, sentimental, overly inward looking thing or way of seeing. And, but the heart, is um something so much stronger and broader and wider yeah. than that isn't it? And, and i mean you you've hit totally on the theme of my research which you know having had the experiences that i've had you know that the heart itself like you say is is it can only ever live beyond the biological organ as something that is mushy and sentimental but that is again mary that's only through a particular framing and it's through, through a particular narrative and as a as, as a kind of scientific narrative um it, it's reduced to mere metaphor mm. but if we go back to what we were saying before and again this is not to deride or or, or be derogatory about the scientific method but it's mm. just to say okay the, the scientific um labeling of the heart is a pump and that's perfectly valid it's an organ mm. of the body mm. but if we move to a both and way of thinking then there is another movement that we can make something that is allowed to come alongside the narrative of the 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 the, the kind of dominant narrative that we have today which is pretty rationalistic and scientific in its in its gaze and rather than it being put subservient and then in that sense the heart can only live as a metaphor or sentimental mush if we we'll open up and expand we can allow something to come in and alongside so in yeah. the moving alongside rather than being put underneath, mm. the heart can live then as something else, which allows us to sense and feel and intuit and imagine. And yeah. it's, that has never gone away and it is open to us. This is something we can, we can gather up and experience. It's just our perception and our way of being educated tells us that we must think about the heart in a particular way. But, and I would leave with this question, Mary, um, and then open to you to, to sort of speak through a, a Renaissance art point of view. How does bringing a, another heart alongside the organ of the heart respectfully and openly cause any problem to us whatsoever? 
And I would say it doesn't. I would say that actually adds so much to our experience and our narrative. It doesn't take away anything. It adds more. Mm, absolutely. And it's interesting that you brought up those slides initially of the pictures of nature um, outside. And of course, you know, as you say, the senses, you know, we sort of think of the senses as something perhaps as well, which is cut off from our internal language and our inner um, heart, our inner ears, our inner eyes and so forth. Um, everything's become so split, but obviously one of the most um, wonderful things in the Renaissance was this huge awakening of the senses um, to the natural world and nature was understood as maestra. She was mistress. She was absolutely above man, although man was part of nature, but nature was this wonderful um, aspect of, of living to honour and to see and for the renaissance artists they had to have both a receptivity to nature so an ability to open and receive um, and that was through the eye but the eye as you may or may not know was the was the window to the soul at that time and the soul was obviously um connected to the heart and um they had to have a receptivity but they also had to have an observation so again you get this two-way pull so an openness inwards and an observation outwards yeah. towards the world and um probably one of the most well-known artists that everybody knows is leonardo da vinci mm -hmm. prolific um outpouring of drawings um which were partly preparatory drawings for later masterpieces or works of art he was um commissioned to paint but lots of them were his own observations of the world itself and how he saw the world. And one of his biographers, who's actually a contemporary biographer, Charles Nicholl, um, in a wonderful biography he's written about Leonardo da Vinci called Flights of the Mind. Mm -hmm. And he has written in there and he says, if I can remember the quote, he says, um, Leonardo da Vinci had an openness and receptivity to the world around him, an almost explicitly childlike state which allowed him to see into the heart of things. And it was absolutely this sort of wonderful, keen observation and also this fascination, wonderment, awe at the world around us, which again, we've lost, you know, we've become, we dumb, we're dumbed down, our senses are so dumbed down. And yet our senses, and in particular for the Renaissance, it was the eye um, because of its metaphorical meaning as well. Um, was was utterly open to the world around mm. and I'm just going to show just for an example um, You know looking at a, an, a work of art such as this which is yeah. Leonardo da Vinci's version of the rocks from the National Gallery You know to most people Might just sort of wander past or it might get some attention because it is by Leonardo da Vinci And he's probably one of the most famous paintings from that time mm. Um, and to most people it would just look like a religious image and I'm not really going to go into it all too much now but um, for instance when he was looking at how to get this wonderful shading on the Virgin's face um, he would look at the moon and he'd look at the shadows on the moon and that's how he would paint um, and understand the shading that should fall on a female face but in particular her because she's um, a divine figure and she's illuminated and you'd look at a work of art like that and you might not think look strange to the modern eye because there are images that we don't really connect with anymore um, unless you follow a particular religious um, mind train of thought um, but they are absolutely embodied and embedded with this wonderful observation of nature and even down here you've got these tiny little um, flowers and leaves which he's absolutely looked at nature and those particular flowers in order to get them accurate to put them into the painting as with his observation of gesture of movement of emotion in the human body i've taken some people to look at this painting and because the eyes are downcast, especially on the Virgin, yeah. uh, one participant said once they thought she looked depressed, 
And I thought, isn't that interesting? Because yeah. we're so used to seeing um, a different sort of image that we're supposed to put to the to the world. You know, but she's not. She's in her own world of um, inner conversation. You know, mm -hmm. there's a sort of silent conversation going on there between them, and, and it's between the gesture and the body. Yeah. But his. Um, let's find this other one here. This is one of his very famous drawings that I'm sure lots of people have seen before. Yeah. Um, but it's the Star of Bethlehem and it's in red chalk, which is a beautiful medium to use because it's very soft. Mm. Um, but it's just wonderful how he's got this exquisite observation of nature um, and the behaviour of this particular flower, which gives it a character. You know, it gives it a sort of personality and his other little sketches around so and he he drew many flowers the same flower he would draw them from lots of different angles um which is a an expression really of of looking at things in from different ways mm -hmm. all the time not mm -hmm. just from one way um but they're exquisite drawings oh, very yeah. beautiful um and have their own language and and character mm -hmm. absolutely they're beautiful mary So that was um, just a couple of, of pictures, really, to sort of, um, you know, not decode and demystify paintings and that sort of thing. But, you know, there's definitely this sense of um, appreciation, mm. receptivity and absolute observation and patience, you know, and close attentiveness. You know, these are all qualities that perhaps, you know, resonate with the title of what we um have called you know sort of what we're talking about today you know the noticing the seeing the feeling yeah. the listening um you know how often do we have time to look look at nature and you know most people are rushing around with their busy lives i think this current situation with the coronavirus has actually mm -hmm. given people time to slow down and although people don't like the sense of uncertainty because we're not used to that either and we want yeah. to know what's going to happen and it and of course there are worries and fears which are very natural um and are a very real concern mm. but it's definitely allowed us to slow down and really look and um just stand and and really watch and observe and be open at the same time to perhaps something that we don't normally see beneath this this other layer that we've we've lathered on top of mm. life we can't really see what's going on underneath yeah absolutely i mean i think simplicity <clears throat> and a profundity in yeah. it which is quite beautiful mm, definitely i mean I, I totally agree with you and i think you know what you're you know as you were talking then what particularly came up for me was that um you know these sort of wider more expansive ways of seeing in you know uh, in, in your particular uh, narrative and, and and mine you know renaissance art Gertian inquiry you know sort of sinking into the heart first before moving up to the head um it can be sort of um used really in, in any part of our life um you know to, to sort of connect with um you know for example coronavirus um you know i found myself um you know trying to move upstream trying to watch what's happening for me particularly in my own world um you know um not really sure a lot of the time what's arising for me in terms of how i'm feeling and and sort of trying to um hold more the uh, discomfort that i feel a lot of the time um you know without sort of reaching for uh, going downstream reaching for a solution Mm, mm. you know yes. so these these ways of seeing for me and, and I, you know doing these conversations with you and sort of having more time and reflecting more on my own work and research mm. has um you know given me beautifully more more time to consider you know how can i um sort of use these ways of seeing or or um sort of sit sit with these ways of seeing um uh you know in terms of what's happening in in the world at the moment um yeah. and you know I, i'm not saying that that's easy either you know i'm 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 really finding uh probably like most people this situation very difficult 
Mm, mm. Um, but there are certainly wider insights I think that I'm getting, particularly in you know, so walking around the park and taking those photographs and understanding, um, you know, sort of learning more about what that means to me um, and where I would possibly want my life to go, or you know, what's happening for other people, and you know, just slowing down, having more time to contemplate. I think, but also being very aware that um, a lot of the time I don't know. Yes. I don't know how I feel. I don't know what's going on. Um, and, and that can be quite uncomfortable. Mm. Um, so it's kind of holding that um, discomfort as well, I think, that, that, that these ways of seeing have kind of um, brought me very present with. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I agree, Louise. It's, it's, um, it is a, an interesting time and a challenging time and a very, you know, for some incredibly devastating time yeah, as well yeah. i think these are all things that throughout life though we experience i think we're just experiencing it all together in a particular way at yeah. this moment we always have life and death there's always disease and there are always cures and sometimes there aren't mm -hmm. and there's often you know we we have this sort of plethora of, of everything that happens that could possibly happen um going on most of the time in the world i suppose it's just with this that we're all experiencing it in a different sort of collective way that we're not used to and we have got an enforced lockdown which means we ha we don't have the freedom to go out in that sense and some people perhaps feel their civil li liberty is being challenged but yeah um, it, the situation is what it is and you have to try and as you say um, make it the best that you can or at least perhaps just take the foot off the accelerator mm -hmm. and think I'm going to have to just navigate my way through this the best way I can and we certainly are not used to not being in control and I think that's what a lot of people are struggling with is the sense of a loss of control mm -hmm. um, although you know ironically we are being controlled by things other than the virus yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, such as the government but um, <laughs> but having said that, I think um, it's a time for um, reflection as well and perhaps people to look at things or read things that they wouldn't normally have time to look at and read and being in nature, I mean nature, me living in London, um, goodness, is certainly louder, you know, the birds are very loud. <laughs> I can hear all sorts of different layers of, of bird song every evening and every morning if I stand in my garden. Mm -hmm. But also the Renaissance, just to finish up what I feel I wanted to um, share really, is that um, the plague um, which finished around 1350 in Italy um, was an absolutely dreadful disease and it killed millions of the population um, around Europe. And... Um, it, um, however, having said that, through that dreadful period with um, people suffering, there was at the same time this huge rise in empathetic and compassionate um, religious texts and responses to images. And that's why the whole shift and the change of, of works of art happened, so that people have more of an effective response. So it actually moved at that time from this sort of scholarly idea of religion just up in the head back down into the heart um, and that altered the how pictures how paintings and how sculpture started to look they weren't just sort of flat two-dimensional symbolic looking pictures they became something which was there to evoke emotion and response in the viewer so I just wanted to and then you know obviously the renaissance really sort of um, took flight at the beginning of the 1400s and that was just sort of 20, 30, 40 years after the plague had completely died out. So it does seem throughout history that where there's been a big disaster on a certain level um, rises up from the ashes in the end. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really lovely place to, to kind of leave that, Mary. That just feels very profound. Oh, thanks, Louise. Um, but um, yes, did you want to show your um, sense of, of 
where we might be going on the next our next conversation yeah definitely um so um next time i think it's next week isn't it mary um yes we will be uh just bear with me a second <clears throat> So this week we were looking at noticing, uh, seeing, listening and feeling. Um, next week we're going to be looking at opening. So opening up towards, um, you know, things that are happening in the world. Um, like, like we're talking about now, like you were talking about Mary with coronavirus and, you know, all these, uh, you know, looking at all the atrocities that are taking place across the world and, you know, ecological yeah. destruction, degradation. You know, how do we open up to consider all of these things that are happening in our world through the ways mm. of seeing that we've been sort of exploring this morning, really, um, through our own narratives. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the idea for, okay. for next week. Yeah. But also, uh, yeah, use, using our discernment as well. So, so using the head and the heart, using all of the ways of perception open to us. Um, mm. gathering everything up from the past to the present um, ancient to now um, and, and really seeing how we can move forward you know with with these really pressing global issues today yes absolutely yeah okay lovely to talk to you Louise yes and you Mary it's been wonderful as always so yes yeah, so um, just to say thank you for everyone for joining us for listening to us today and if you want to find out more about our work then please do visit uh, Mary's website, maryatwood.com, or my website, heartsenseresearch.co.uk. Um, any comments that you have, please, you know, engage us in conversation. Uh, this is all part of the dialogue, um, and we're just really grateful and blessed to have you here. So, heartfelt blessings to you all, and and hopefully see you next week. Thank Thanks, you, Mary. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Louise.